If you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. And I want to speak to you about accepting God's call and accepting the results. God calls us to salvation. We respond. We become believers. God has a plan and a purpose for our life. But the results are not because of what we've done. So you might witness to someone, or you might witness to 100 people and nobody gets saved. The results does not matter. The results are left to God. But not only the results, but also the afflictions. We need to be able to accept those in the adversities. We're going to see in Jeremiah that Jeremiah, God speaks through Jeremiah to Israel and to Judah. Then Jeremiah speaks back to God and complains a little while. Then he begins to praise God. And then God really never answers him officially in the, the rest of this passage. And we see him go back into a, another depression. But then we'll see him later come out of it. Often when life becomes burdensome and seems that it's impossible to bear, we begin to question God. And you yourself have probably at times said, why God? Why this? Why me? Even people today be saying, God, why did you allow this virus? God, why are you allowing this chaos to take place in a country that we love that is so dear to us? We know it's not our home. But I got to admit, it's a great place to be passing through. One day, we'll get to our home. It'll be glorious. There'll be no riots. Nobody's going to observe, observe the throne of our king. But until then, there will be those who ask why. I have asked why before. We need to remember that many of our heroes of the faith also ask why. In fact, the weeping prophet here, Jeremiah, is asking why. Why, Lord, why do you allow these things to happen? So at the outset, I want to let you know that the main point of the message today is that when people accept God's call to serve him, and when you became a believer, that's what you became. You accepted his call to serve him. It's not about you being saved. It's about us serving him and making his name known. But when we do that, we must accept the results and the adversities that follow. God never promised a bed of roses. He does promise eternal life. But he doesn't say that the rest of our journey here on earth will be pleasant or that it will be fun, it will be exciting, it will be glorious. Those results are left to him. Our adversities are left to him. Jeremiah had delivered some amazingly harsh messages from the Lord. And now in chapter 20, he's going into the temple to deliver a harsh message. It would be an understatement to say that this was a bold step on his part. However, he had been commissioned by God, and he has to follow whatever the cost. And I would say that's what God says to us today. We are followers. We are believers. We are partakers of truth, and God has an assignment for us. And at times it will be easy. At times it will be hard. There will be difficulty, but we need to complete the task that God has given us, just like Jeremiah, no matter what the cost. Jeremiah has a harsh message for pasture who was an overseer. When God appointed Jeremiah over the nations, he used that same Hebrew word to describe him and Pasher. They both were overseers. They were both supposed to guide Israel and Judah, but Pasher had sold out. He sold out to the, the status quo, and now Jeremiah is going to confront him. Beginning in verse 1, and we'll read all 18 verses. It says, When Pasher the priest, the son of Emmer, who was the chief officer of the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Pastor had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and had him put in stocks by the upper gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And on the next day when Pastor released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, Pastor is not the name the Lord has called you by, but rather Magor Misabib. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I am going to make you a terror to yourself and to all of your friends. And while your eyes look on them, they will fall by the sword of their enemies. So I will give over all Judah to the hand of the king of Babylon and will carry them away as exiles into Babylon and will slay them with a sword. And I will also give their wealth of all this city and all its produce and all the costly things, even the treasures of the king of Judah, I will give over to the hand of the enemies. And they will plunder and take them away and bring them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and you, Pasher, and all who live in your house, you will go into captivity, you will enter into Babylon, and you will die there. 
and you will be buried there. You and all your friends to whom you have falsely prophesied. O Lord, you have deceived me and I am deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed and I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction. Because for me, this word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all the day long. But if I say I will not remember him, if I say I will not speak any more of his name, then my heart becomes like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. For I have heard the whisperings of many, terror on every side. Denounce him. Yes, let us denounce him. And all my trusted friends watching for me to fall say, Perhaps he will be deceived, and we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord says, or but the Lord is like a dreaded champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed. With an everlasting disgrace, they will, be, will, they will not be forgotten. Yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who is in the mind and who is in the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have set forth my cause. Sing unto the Lord, praise the Lord. For he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hand of the evildoers or the wicked. Cursed be the day which I was born. Let not him be blessed, or let not that day be blessed when my mother bore me. Cursed be the man who brought me forth to my father, the news that a baby boy has been born. And make him not happy. But let him be a man who, like the cities which are overthrown by the Lord, without relenting, and let him hear an outcry in the morning, a shout of alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me before birth, so my mother would have been my grave, and her womb would have still been pregnant. Why would I ever come forth from the womb to look at trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? Well, this doesn't sound very encouraging, it seems like the, the one section in here where he begins to praise God, but other than that, there's, there's trouble on every side. There's turmoil. Three things I want us to look at here. If we're going to serve God, sometimes when we begin to serve him, it's going to cost us something. I want us to look in verses 1 through 6 at the message of God from the stocks. So we see that Jeremiah was put in stocks, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But look at these first six verses. He's talking to Pastor the high priest, who, by the way, had not heard Jeremiah's earlier message. So now Jeremiah is, is coming to the temple, and that's the first time he hears it, but he doesn't accept the message. Notice what it says here is to Pasher, the son of Emmer. The leading priest apparently did not attend Jeremiah's dramatic sermon he'd already preached, and now he hears it, and he's going to refuse to accept it. This is refers to him as a chief officer. Some, some call him a governor. Apparently, he was immediate subordinate to the high priest, and he maintained uh, order over the temple. And here's Jeremiah preaching chaos and disorder, and so they had him arrested. Notice his paramount pastor had Jeremiah beaten and put him into stocks. Now, the official beating, if this was an official beating, that what would take in place, the word that is used here in Hebrew, beaten or smote. Some translations say they smote him, they beat him. What it was called is official beating came with 40 stripes less one. In other words, he would have been beaten. If this was an official beating, he would have been put into the stocks and he would have been beaten 39 times with a whip. And uh, they said that 40 would kill a man, but 39 would not. In other words, they're bringing him to the brink of death, according to their system. But not only that, notice it talks about the stocks. The root word for stocks means to distort. And what they would do, they would put prisoners in these stocks, and they would be put in a position where their muscles would grow tired, where their muscles couldn't hold on and begin to quiver and shake. In other words, not only is this disgrace, but this is pain, this is agony. And the longer he was there more and more agonizing it would become. He would become more and more distorted in that position because his muscles couldn't hold him up. And that's what the stocks were all about, was increasing the pain. So it was to disgrace him. But notice what it says here. Where did they do it? They did it by the gate, which was at the house of the Lord. This was intentional. This was where Pasher had his power. He was the priest. He had power there. And all those going by would know, well, Jeremiah's not only a lunatic, he's a traitor. 
Because pastor has been saying, no, everything's fine. We're going to be delivered. Egypt or Assyria, one will deliver us from the Babylonians. God will deliver. Somebody's going to deliver us. And Jeremiah said, no, there is no delivery. You're going into captivity. And so he was considered to be a traitor. Notice it says the next day, pastor brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. No doubt with most men, after being beaten, after being put in the stocks, if they got out of the stocks, they're going to keep their mouth shut and they're going to get out of town. And surely, Pastor, he knew this. Every other man that was put in his position would have done it. Surely, Jeremiah's going to shut his mouth and get out of town. But he didn't. Notice what <laughs> I love Jeremiah. Look what he says. I mean, here's a guy for, for a whole day and a whole night and, and, and until the next, the next morning. He's been suffering. He's been in pain. He's been mocked. No doubt he would have probably been spit at and cursed. And he gets out of the stocks. And he says, the Lord has not called your name Pasher, but he's called you Magor Misabib. Now, the meaning of Pasher is freedom or peacefulness. It speaks of living at ease. But the name Magor Migor Misabib means terror on every side. Notice what he says. Your name isn't pasture. There's not going to be peace and prosperity. There's not going to be ease in your life. God says there's that you and on every side of you is going to be terror. You see the contrast. You may think this is the way it is, but God says. So immediately he, we see him going back and preaching, being faithful. He's discouraged. You and I would be discouraged if we'd been put in those stocks. And all we're trying to do is preach the unadulterated word of God the way God gives it to us. That's what you're trying to do. And then you get through all this trouble and all these trials and tribulation. And he gets out of the stocks and he goes right back to preaching. Now he's going to tell us later that there's times he wants to give up. But he's so committed to God, he just can't give up. Notice he says, I will make a terror out of you and your friends, all of your friends. Jeremiah showed him that whatever he thought he was going to do, that was not what's going to happen. God has control of this, and he and his friends were going to be suffering terror. They were going to be fearful from every side. And he says, and I will give all Judah to the hand of the king of Babylon. So Jeremiah's message has not changed. That's what he's been preaching all along. The message hadn't changed. God is going to deliver them into the hands of the Babylonians, and they would be conquered. Well, that's God's message from the stocks. But let's look at God's message after the stocks from his prophet, verse 7 through 18. We see the burden here of a prophet who'd been persecuted over and over and over again. And yes, there's a time in here why he's praising God, but he's doing it through misery, which tells us no matter how miserable things get, we should also be praising God because he is faithful. Even if it, we don't see his faithfulness, he always remains faithful. In verses 7 8, Jeremiah speaks to God through his faithfulness. He says, you are stronger than I, speaking to God here, and you have prevailed. Jeremiah explained to God that he had not been compelled of his own desire to go and preach. He didn't pursue it. God's one who called him. God, you're stronger than I am. God, you have seduced me, so to speak, and you have prevailed. I didn't, I didn't ask for this prophetic life. You gave it to me. And God, because of your strength, because of your power, you have prevailed. But it's interesting Look here, and this, where he's talking about the whole design of it, he said, basically, you have seduced me. This word pata literally means to be produced, but it means to be seduced by the law. It's the same as in Exodus twenty two sixteen and Judges 16, 5. This is talking about the law, how the law is seductive. And here's what Jeremiah is saying. God, when I came to you and you came to me and you made an agreement with me, I thought that we had kind of a marriage relationship. But I feel like you have subdued me, and I went out, and I've been faithful to you, and now I find myself all alone. So, God, you have seduced me into doing this, and you, and you are the one who got the victory because you're the one that's prevailed. You're stronger than I am. I thought we had this relationship. And so we see the desperation in there. That's what he says. I'm in derision all day long, or I am being laughed at. I'm a laughing stock. God, nobody takes me serious. This is, this is serious here. He is in pain. He's in agony. Everyone, every single person here mocks me. Surely Jeremiah was talking about the, the event that had just taken place. There he was for 24 hours or maybe a little bit longer. And so he was, he was there and people were going by and laughing and mocking. Surely this is what he's referring to here. But it says, the word of the Lord came to me, a reproach and a derision or ridicule. In other words, people ridicule me daily. It's not just happened once in a while. Everywhere I go, people see me. They mock me. They ridicule me. I'm nothing but a laughingstock. 
as a faithful messenger of the Lord, it was difficult for Jeremiah to endure the reproach and do the, the, the derision. And I got to be honest with you. When, when you preach and you preach and you preach and you preach and you do your best, no matter how good you are or how bad you are, but you've done your very, very best for God, you couldn't have done any better, and people would make fun of it, it hurts. It's painful. And this is what Jeremiah lived with, not just on a Sunday to Sunday, not only once a month, not once every two years. Every single day he felt like, my life is a reproach. People are ridiculing me. My life is under derision every single day. Part of it was because Jeremiah's word, he'd been preaching and preaching and preaching and nothing happened. And he preaches and preaches and preaches and nothing happens. They were, look, he kept saying, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And the longer it didn't happen, the more people made fun of him. Look in verses 9 and 10. I want to focus on these for just a few minutes because Jeremiah resolves to stop the prophetic work. He says, I'm just going to stop it. Notice what he says. He says, but if I say I will not remember him, or speak anything in his name, then when my heart, it becomes like a burning fire. It's shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in. And I cannot endure it, for I have heard the whispering of many terror on every side. Denounce him. Yes, let us denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for me to fall says perhaps he will be deceived, and we may prevail against him, and we may take our revenge on him. Notice here it says, if I do not mention your name, if I don't recall your name anymore, Jeremiah realized on many occasions he actually contemplated giving up. But notice what he says. He says, I cannot do it. And the reason he can't do it is because he's so committed. He is totally committed to God. And so we see here, Jeremiah doubts. Jeremiah's doubts were never expressed in public. It's always one-on-one. So you never find him in public angry with God. Every single time that he's preaching God, every time he's preaching God's message, (laughs) let's just take a moment and pray. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this precious child and just pray that we would not be distracted. Pray that we would get back to focusing on what you would have us to focus on and today that you would, would get, make your message clear to our heart. We love you, Lord. Keep us focused today in Christ's name. Amen. So what we have, Jeremiah is telling God, God, I, if, 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 I, if, I didn't, if I tried not to remember you, if I tried to keep my mouth shut, God, I can't because of all these things that I'm listing. We'll see him throughout Scripture, throughout the book of Jeremiah. On occasions, he's contemplating just giving, I'm throwing in a towel But he can't. And the reason he can't is because he's too committed to compromise. And I would submit to you, isn't that what God's looking for today? Isn't God looking for those of us who put our faith and trust in him? Isn't he looking for us to not compromise? God, if I could not preach, I would not preach. God, if if I could not do this, I would not do this. But I'm so committed to you that no matter how bad I'm suffering, no matter what I have to go through, God, I'm committed. I'm going to keep telling people about Jesus. Why? I can't do anything else. It's like a fire burning within me. Now, notice this. His word was in his heart, burning like a fire, shut up in my bones. Four reasons I want to give you that, that Jeremiah wouldn't give up, that he wouldn't commit, that he wouldn't, wouldn't walk away from God. Notice what he says about this fire. It's because he couldn't, he couldn't forget to speak because he had already dealt with God's word. Anytime I bring a message... I have to deal with it first. If, if I don't deal with it in my own heart, in my own life, and by the way, this was a very, very difficult message to put together, to preach. There have been times in my life, I, I, okay, fine, God, I, I, I just, I, I'll go do something else. I mean, I can work at a marina, I can go to the fire department, I, I can do something. Sure, you know, I mean, I, mean I, I could work with Alan. A lot of different things I could make. Ed might give me a job on a golf course. I want to ride them more. I don't want them push ones. But, but, what, but what is happening here is that if I deal with the text, if I deal with God's word, it gets embedded in my heart and in my life, then you can't get rid of it. And so there have been times I wanted to give up. I just want to throw in. The last 30 years has not been easy. My life was much easier before ministry. But I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't go back. If God said, you, you can have 10 times what you had before, I'd say, no thanks. I'll take what I've got right now. Even with the trials and the tribulation and the heartache that you have to go through. Why? Because I've dealt with God's word. Jeremiah had dealt with God's word. The question that that we have to ask ourselves is, have we dealt 
with God's word. The second reason he couldn't quit is because he lived it. It was alive in his heart. If the word of God is not alive in your heart, you've got a heart problem. I'm not saying physically, but emotionally, you've got a heart problem. It was part of his heart. He was, God's word was living. Third, he couldn't because the word burned in his heart. Now, something interesting about fire. Sometimes fire heals and it soothes. When it's cold out, we like to be around the fire pit. We like the warmth coming from it. But sometimes fire gets hot. And sometimes it, it burns and causes pain. And what Jeremiah here is saying is, is this is causing me pain. This fire is burning so deep in my heart, I've got to get rid of it. My question for us is, are we willing to go through the pain that God might have to put into our lives, through the fire that he might put into our lives? In other words, if it burns deep within our soul, if the word of God doesn't burn deep within our soul, there's something wrong. It should be burning deep. And then the fourth reason that he had to stay committed, that he couldn't just walk away from it. Notice what he says. The word pressed against his very being. It's shut up in my bones. It requires great energy to hold it in. And Jeremiah said, I'm tired of holding it back. I can't hold it back. I have to preach forth the word of God. I have to tell Judah what is coming, even though the people are laughing at me. People are making fun of me. I hate my life right now, but I have no choice because I've got to get this that's in me out. I wish that every one of us had so much of that in us, we'd have no choice that people would be saying, boy, I'm tired of Phil coming over and trying to witness to me. I'm tired of, you know... Because we're so committed to him, it burns within us. With Jeremiah, he found out it was impossible to deny his call. He also found out he couldn't repress God's word. It's got to come out. And for Jeremiah, it came out even in times of peril. So under stress and pain and suffering, he was tempted to abandon his word, but he said, I just can't do it. If God, if I could refuse to speak for you, I'd stop it. But I can't stop it. He attempted to. But here's what he's saying, God, out of all that I'm going through, you remember yesterday, you remember the stocks, you remember all the people laughing at me, you remember all the people who are wanting to, to beat me and those who want my demise, God, in spite of all of that, it is more painful for me not to go forth and share your word. And Jeremiah said, no matter what I'm going through, I have to share your word. It's burning me up from the inside out. Notice what he says. I could not, in spite of all the pain. He said, it doesn't, well, I may not. He says, I can't. It's impossible. I can't do this. I'm compelled to share your word the way you give it, and I have no option. I am burdened with it, but I'm burdened more to carry it than I am to give it. Notice what he says, and I heard many mocking. They mocked Jeremiah's message of coming catastrophe. They wanted him to fall. They were looking to take revenge on him. Notice what he says, for I've heard the whispering of many's terror on every side. Now, do you remember what he said to Pasher? Now they're, they're, calling, they're, they're twisting that and calling him that. They're saying, oh, you said this about the priest, but let me tell you what, Jeremiah, you're the one that terror is coming on every side. So they were mocking him. That's what happened through the stocks. God's word came through the stocks. But then the third thing is God's manifestation through the stocks. Jeremiah's experience in the stocks brought revelation with his experience. God revealed to Jeremiah that even though Jeremiah had great confidence and boldness in delivering God's word, he was still human. And he's going to face times of trials and tribulation. When you make your commitment to God, I'm going to live the Christian life the very best I can. I'm going to say yes to the things you say yes. I'm going to say no to the things you say no. I'm going to live out my Christian life the best I can. I'm going to be faithful to you. And even when trials and tribulation comes, we're still human. There'll be times we ask God, why? God, do you realize what I have done? Do you realize what I have given up? God, do you realize what pain and suffering I'm in? Why, why, why? We're human. We will do those things. But if we, if we can stop talking about him, if we can stop coming to church, if we can stop worshiping him, if we don't have that fire within us, there's a problem. Jeremiah couldn't stop preaching. He couldn't stop teaching. Verses 11 and 12, notice his confidence in God here. He says, but the Lord is with me like a dread companion. Therefore, my persecutors, they will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they will fail. He knows God. He knows God's going to do this, but he's still in pain. And he says, with an everlasting disgrace, they will not be forgotten. Yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, 
Let me see your vengeance on them. For you I have set forth my cause. In other words, God, I've settled it with you. He says you're like that dread champion. Some verses translate that as a mighty awesome one. Despite the pain and difficulty he faced with all the enemies, he said, God, I know you are right here with me, and you are the awesome one. You are the mighty one. In spite of all the humiliation, all the rejection, God, you are mightier. You are greater than those. Therefore, my persecutors, because of who you are, they will not prevail. They will stumble. He says, oh, Lord of hosts, you, the one who tests the righteous, I'm laying all this at your feet. God, I'm going to give this to you. I know that you will judge on earth what is right. And in the verse 13, we see him turn and praising God. He's, he's down in the dumps. He's hurting. He's painful. And then all of a sudden, I would say he comes to his senses, if you'll let me put it that way. He begins to praise God. He says, sing to the Lord. Notice the, the, the contrast here. I mean, he is hurting. And in the midst of his pain, he, he gets this energy up that's within his soul. He says, sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. The prophet's heart here overflowed with praise. Why? Because he realized how strong God was and God's stronger than all the things that you and I will ever face. He says, he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of the evildoers or the wicked. And it wasn't Jeremiah's pain and problem that was going to go away because he's now praising God. The pain and the problem is still going to be there. But in spite of the pain, in spite of the depression, he's finding time to praise God. And in verses 14 through 18, he deals with the grief and depression. Again, he slides back out of the praise and back into depression. That's why he says, cursed is the man who brought the news to my father. I love this here. I wish I'd just been, been born dead in my mother's womb. I mean, God, why did you even create? Why did you let me even be delivered? Of course, the problem was Jeremiah didn't go far enough back. God had already told him in chapter 1, Jeremiah, before I knew you, or before you were in the womb, I knew you. So you can go back to the mother's womb, but I, I, our relationship goes back further. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations before you were ever in your mother's womb. So Jeremiah just didn't go back far enough. In other words, God's in control of everything in spite of the fact that, that he said, I wish I had just died in my mother's womb. Otherwise, I've spent my life in shame. Notice he said, cursed be the day that I was born. Well, not very many people in Bible and certainly not very many people today would say, cursed be the day that I was born. Does that kind of give us a little bit of the idea of just how painful his life was for Jeremiah? Now we can understand a little better why we call him the weeping prophet. He did weep for himself, but he wept for Judah and for Israel even more. We'll see that later. He says, let that man be like the cities that were overthrown by the Lord. Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities we know from Genesis 19, verse 24 through 28. He said, why did I even come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow? He knows God had a purpose for his life. He's just questioning why God. Why didn't you just shut it up before? Notice what he says, I'm consumed with shame. The passage here depicts a man who's loudly, boldly proclaiming his lot in life. And he's showing, he says, God, I'm still submissive. I still want to fulfill your purpose. But God, my whole life is nothing but shame. Shame and disgrace. I'm consumed with shame. Well, if this ended here, we'd all go home and, and probably say, I don't think I'm going back to church. It's depressing i got to be honest with you. By the end of this, I don't know. I want to come back to church. This is depressing. But if we'll just read a few years later, and this same man who's hurting and still committed to God, still serving God, but letting God have it, letting him know how, how painful it is. And it's even more painful not to do what God asked him to do. Writes Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. Jeremiah says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. This same man who is so down in the dumps yeah, he finds time to praise God, and he lets God know, I'm still faithful to you. I may not want to be, but I am, because the Word of God is so deep and rich, burning in my heart. I'm being pressed in on every side by the Word of God. That just a little later, he could write Lamentations. 
application here, remember the main point of the message is that when we accept God's call to serve him, that we must also accept the results. I don't get to pick the assignment God gives me. God gets to pick it. My job is just to be faithful to do what God's called me to do. And as, Christian, as Christians, we should expect afflictions and trials and tribulations. There should be heartache, but also our hearts should burn for God. One more time. Lamentations 3, starting in verse 22. I find it so amazing. He could be so hurt and so down. And then write this. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. He realized that no matter how bad things were, he was not going to be totally consumed. God always offers hope. Because his compassions fail not, they've never failed and they never will. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Isn't it great to know that no matter how faithful or unfaithful we are, he always remains faithful. And Jeremiah knows that. But then notice this, the Lord is my portion. Well, there's a lot in that. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, because he is my portion, I will hope in him. Notice it says, through the Lord's mercies we're not consumed. We can take comfort in knowing that God will not leave us out there to be totally consumed. He will leave us out there for a period of time, but then he will come back and comfort us. He will not let us be consumed. Why? Because his mercy is new every morning. Spurgeon said concerning this passage about the mercies, he said these mercies are always new because they come from God. Our treasures which we lay up on earth are just stagnant pools, but the treasure which God gives us is from heaven. And in providence and in grace, it is the crystal fount from which flows up everything from eternal depths and is always fresh and always new. Every morning ends the night. And Jeremiah was going through a dark, dark night. Every morning brings a new day. Every morning brings new provision for that day. Every morning brings new forgiveness for the new sins of that day. Every morning brings forth strength to endure the temptations and the duties and the trials that God has assigned us. Notice this, as great as your faithfulness, this made Jeremiah consider just how faithful God was, even in the midst of all that Jeremiah was going on. So I love the fact the way Jeremiah says this. He calls him your faithfulness. God, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. It's the same as in Psalm 119.57. Jeremiah realized that the key to satisfaction for his soul was to find his portion in the Lord. And here's what he's saying. He said, I have found my portion in you. And because I found my portion in you, I have hope. Here's what it boils down to. Jeremiah's soul was satisfied with the portion that he had. Okay, God, I don't get to be king. I don't get to have a life of, of, of serving you in the temple. I don't get to do all these things. God, your portion for me is good enough whatever you've assigned me. So, Lord, if you want to assign me, this is my lot in life. This is what you have for me. Lord, it's okay. Why? Because my lot in life is not my portion. You are my portion. When he becomes our portion, our soul is satisfied. And so what we have to ask ourselves is this, is you can't realize great is thy faithfulness until you really understand the fact that he is our portion. And once we accept the fact that he's our portion, it provides hope. And then we can have that satisfied soul. So let me ask you this. Is your soul satisfied today? Have you honestly come to a place in your life where you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be your Savior? If you haven't, you need to come to this altar, and, and I'll pray with you because you need Jesus. If he hasn't satisfied your soul, what is it that gives you that burning inside? It's that you're satisfied with who he is in your portion. God gives all of us a different portion but the fact is, he is our portion. Are you satisfied with it? Are you content? Is there peace? Is there fulfillment? Remember, times are going to be hard. And if we're honest with ourselves, our country's facing perilous times. And we're going to have to go through that unless the Lord comes back. What's going to get us through it? Knowing that he's our portion. Know that, know that we will not be totally consumed. I mean, after all, we do have a better place to go. I'm not saying we need to take the next bus out, but I'm not saying we shouldn't either if, if you had that choice. The, the thing that I get out of Jeremiah is this. God calls people to love him and to serve him. 
And sometimes that road is easy and sometimes that road is hard. Sometimes that road, there, there's so much inside of you that you just want to get rid of and there's times you just want to shut it up. There's times you want to ask God why. And by the way, can I just say it's okay to ask God why? Not why as to his character. Not why as to his faithfulness. But you can say, okay, God, why me? And then what will happen is once you get back in God's word, you'll realize just how faithful he is. He is worthy of whatever we have to go through. Thank you.